This series is part of the Virtues and Vocations Initiative here at Duke University, which seeks to make questions of character, purpose, and meaning central to education and pre-professional and professional education in particular. My name is Suzanne Shanahan, and I direct the Keenan Institute for Ethics the institutional home for this initiative and this series. Before we begin, just a brief note about logistics. Please note two things. First, uh, the conversation will last for about 40 minutes, at which point we'll open it up to audience Q&A. Please submit your questions through the Q&A mechanism and they will pass, be passed on directly to me. We often aggregate the questions so we can get to as many as possible so please don't take offense if your question is altered in some small way. Second, as with everything Zoom, there are often technical challenges. Please know that there are several people working behind the scenes to swiftly jump in and address any problems that might emerge. And with that, I am absolutely thrilled to bits to introduce Bill Damon on the connection between purpose and character. Bill is a professor of education at Stanford University he is director of the Stanford Center on Adolescence and a senior fellow by courtesy at the Hoover Institution. A psychologist by training, he is one of the world's leading researchers on the development of purpose. He is author of many, many, many a book, including The Path to Purpose, The Moral Child, Greater Expectations, Some Do Care, Lives of Moral Commitment, Good Work, and The Power of Ideals. He is also coming out with a new book in June called A Round of Golf with My Father, The New Psychology of Exploring Your Past to Make Peace with Your Present, which he's going to give us a sneak preview of, at least I hope. Uh, Damon's present work also includes a Mellon study that explores the development of purpose in the college years and a study of family purposes across generations. Damon has been elected to membership in the National Academy of Education and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was also named one of the 50 most influential psychologists in the world. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm delighted to be here. I'm a big admirer of Keenan and all that you do. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Great, thank you so much. So as we discussed, I think we're gonna do three things in this conversation first talk a little bit about your work on purpose and you're gonna share a brief overview with us, then talk a little bit about this crazy year and how it may be changing or amplifying your thinking, and then talk a little bit about what this has to do with higher education. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it to you to sort of give us a brief overview of purpose, what it is, how we should be thinking about it. Great. Well, let me start with what sounds like the most boring thing of all, which is the definition of purpose. But it's actually really important because, uh, first of all, people use the word purpose in a zillion different ways, especially these days. It's become a bit of a buzzword in everything from education to uh, psychology to pop uh, discourse throughout the world. And uh, of course, when that happens, people use the word projecting whatever they want to talk about. So I do want to uh, take maybe three or four minutes to, um, to talk about definition because psychology and education are both science and practice. And in science and practice, you really want to have a word mean the same thing every time you use it. I mean, think of medicine. If, if you use the word, if doctors use the word kidney uh, differently every time they talk about kidneys, it would be kind of frightening to go into surgery uh, for your kidney. Who knows what they would take out? So uh, I'm, I'm going to just sh share a couple of slides uh, to uh, to give you just a little bit of a, um, a a little bit of a treatment of the definition of purpose. We we spent about a year when we started. Uh, researching purpose to see how it had been used in philosophy, theology, and so on. And we came up with, uh, I believe, a pretty good consensus of what's unique about purpose. Why is purpose different than every other concept? And uh, what's special about it? Why do you need the word at all? So let me share this. Um, uh, and uh, I'm hoping, it, it, 
I'm hoping you can see the slide. Can, give me a nod if you can. So here are a bunch of words that, um, that are used very often con conflated with purpose. Uh, it's very common to hear people say, oh, I wanna have a life of meaning and purpose as if they're kind of the same thing. Of course, if they were the same thing, you wouldn't need two words. That's my whole point. Passion is often used interchangeably with purpose, mandates, dreams, visions, goals. And purpose is connected with all of these. For example, purpose is a goal, but it's not just any kind of goal. If it were, you would not need the word purpose. It's a special kind of goal and it is related to meaning. It's meaningful, but it's not the same. So um, we developed uh, a definition about 15 years ago. And I think that, uh, I think the um, definition is now fairly, fairly widely used in uh, at least developmental psychology. And here are the high points of the definition that I wanna emphasize for our conversation today. Uh, first of all, it's a commitment, an active commitment. It's not just a dream or, or something you kind of uh, wish would happen. It, it, it's a commitment that involves some activity and it is meaningful. Uh, in other words, it's not a, something that you do on command uh, because somebody told you to do it. Uh, a purpose is something that you own in some way. So it does involve meaning. But it's more than meaning. It's it's meaning plus. There are a lot of things that are meaningful in the world, uh, like uh, going to a nice movie or listening to a song. You wouldn't say these are purposes in life. Uh, uh, purpose is also an intention to do something that is of consequence. To to to, it's a commitment to do something of consequence and a consequence to the world beyond the self. It's not all about me. Uh, and this is very common in theology, especially when uh, people write about purpose. Uh, in fact, Rick Warren's book, The uh, Purpose Driven Self starts out with the sentence, it's not all about you. Uh, purpose is beyond the self. So those are the high points of the definition and that's what makes purpose special. And that's what the reason purpose is associated with all of the with all of the benefits that research has uncovered. It's because it's not all about me that people have resilience, motivation, energy. It's because it's a long-term commitment that it gives people a sense of identity and direction. It's because it's a long-term goal that it's connected with academic achievement and vocational success and well-being and vitality. The other concepts that I've mentioned that are associated with purpose do not do the same thing that purpose does. And that's why you need to think of purpose as its own capacity, its own special category. It's not just, uh, it's not just any of the others. Uh, it, it has its own role in life. So that's my little wrap about purpose and uh, the definition. And um, I will stop there and uh, and go on. But I, I did want to start with a definition so we know what we're talking about. So that's great because as you said, purpose is absolutely everywhere, quite a buzzword in all kinds of conversations. So I appreciate that. Let me jump in just with a, a question about how you've defined it. Um, you know, sort of a colleague of mine has, has frequently said, you know, Hitler had a purpose. Um, it, it wasn't a good purpose. It, it, is goodness implicated in your definition at all or how you conceive of it? No, I, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that. And we are gonna talk about the relation uh, between purpose and character. Purpose is a character, uh, purposefulness is a character strength, but it is not necessarily a moral character strength. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit like grit is another example or courage. There are, there are a number of character strengths that can be used for the good or for the ill. And purpose is one of those. Purpose does not come with ethics. And I emphasize this all the time in my educational work because sometimes people think of purpose as kind of a silver bullet that will, will write the script of life for somebody. But, but there are people who are purposeful, who are purposeful for goals that are 
antisocial, that involve violence, involve dishonesty. Ethics is something else. And so purpose is very powerful. Pro-social purpose is very powerful because it enables you to accomplish things uh, because of the long-term commitment that it involves. But, uh, but it is not necessarily moral. So I'm really glad that you asked that question. Great, so um, can we flesh that out just a little bit more? So, you know, sort of that uh, much of your work is about the cultivation of purpose. Right. Um, are, are we not interested in the cultivation of pro-social purpose or of ethical purpose or? We, are, purpose? <laughs> <laughs> we, we better be. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, for educators, and that's why I, I always put the word pro-social before <laughs> purpose, we want to foster pro-social purpose, absolutely. But that does mean that we also have to educate people for moral character as well as purpose and bring in issues such as, to give you one example, that the ends don't justify the means. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have a noble, uh, or not a noble, you can have a, a, an inspire, a purpose that inspires you, uh, and then, or even a noble purpose, as a matter of fact, and then say, well, any way I get there is okay because the end is so important. So I'll lie, cheat, kill, and steal in order to do that. And no, that's not all right. Uh, we need to teach that the ends do not justify the means, but that's a moral point. And uh, that's, that's why purpose really needs to be linked in education with moral education. And so, uh, in your thinking and in your um, work, how do, how do you connect the two? Can you give us a couple of other examples of how they link up? How you think about the relationship between character and and purpose? Right. Uh, well, uh, purpose, uh, like all character strengths, uh, is developed through a number of uh, developmental processes that. Uh, that create a bond uh, between all of them. Uh, for example, the, observ the observation of, uh, of people who are purposeful. Uh, that's a very important developmental experience. And that's the same with all dimensions of character. I mean, character, of course, uh, as, as you folks know, as well as I do, because Keenan is, I think, the uh, I, I look up to you, you people in, in terms of your discussions of character. Uh, you know, character uh, is um, basically a set of virtues, uh, and virtues are habits. Uh, I mean, that's virtues. The the original word, of course, is strengths, uh, and they're habits, and they de they develop over time, and they develop through observation, they develop through practice, uh, through trial and error, through seeing what the outcome is of both the exercise of the virtue and also of non-virtuous behavior. One of the most powerful learning experiences uh, we've learned through our research is when somebody makes a mistake or does something wrong or does not live up to a virtuous action and then gets feedback from it. Uh, the great uh, Swiss psychologist uh, uh, Fritz Oser called that negative morality. Uh, it's, it's one of the most powerful learning experiences. So all of, every character strength is learned in, that, in those ways through observation, feedback, making mistakes, getting feedback on that, practicing. That's how these habits develop. And, uh, and purpose is absolutely one of the set, the purposefulness is one of the sets of character virtues. I'll say one more thing about this, which I think um, maybe sets it apart from other character virtues, or at least a lot of them, is the purpose is a very late developing capacity uh, that we've discovered in our research. As a developmental psychologist, I've studied all kinds of things, all kinds of abilities and skills, and most of them develop rapidly in the childhood and early adolescent years. In purpose, we see the beginnings of it in early adolescence for most people, and it, not much happens. Uh, uh, I mean, I won't quite say that. Things happen, but people don't become fully purposeful most often until well into their early or middle adulthood. Uh, and that's a very late developing 
capacity in the in terms of the range of character strengths that people develop. So I, and and people ask me why it's because it's complicated. Uh, it's very complicated finding purpose, especially these days in this complicated world. That's also a pandemic thing too that we could talk about. But uh, but even without the pandemic, purpose is a late developing character strength relative to others. And so when you say a late developing character strength, it, what age point are you actually talking about? Well, what we find in our, in our research, and by the way, this has been replicated all over the world. We've had a lot of people visiting our center that go back to Brazil, China, Finland, lots of places. And the, the trends seem to be roughly the same as, as I read them. We find that between the ages of about 12 and 22, about one in five, about 20% about of the young people in that age range are fully purposeful. They know what they want to do, why they want to do it. They're committed. They stick with it. I want to be a doctor. I want to, I want to raise children. Purposes aren't always heroic. They're, they can be very mundane. But, uh, but about one in five have figured that out. Uh, about 60% uh, or about 60% of the rest are, are well on their way. In other words, they have elements of that definition that I mentioned. They have the vision, they're active, but they don't have it all put together. And about 25%, it's not even on their radar screen. They're not even looking for goals. They're either um, apathetic or, uh, or hedonistic or depressed or uh, what, uh, other, uh, other reasons why they're not even uh, goal-oriented, let alone purpose-oriented. After age 22 is where we get most of the movement in the population. Uh, beyond that one in five, beyond that 20%. And it, it, it can go on, uh, gee, you know, well into the 30s. Uh, and, and of course, some people never get there at all. But, um, but the, we found the majority start really moving uh, during, it's, it's when they confront, what's my job gonna be? Or do I wanna get married or have a family? Or do, what kind of a citizen do I wanna be? I mean, all of these sources of purpose really come to the fore for most people in their 20s and early 30s. Uh, so, uh, and, and between the ages of 12 and 22, we don't see much movement. Uh, uh, we have about one in five at age 12 and about one in five at age 22. That, that's what I mean by it being a late developing capacity. Well, that's, so that, that's super interesting. And so uh, is part of what you're saying is that purpose, the cultivation of purpose is, is triggered by the need to make sort of defining life choices about job, about citizenship, about family, and that that really moves people to, toward purpose. Exactly, it's very connected with identity. Uh, and of course, identity, as the great psychologist Eric Erickson told us, uh, is, a, is, a, is a prime function of late adolescence. And it's exactly right when people, uh, young people enter, the, look, at, look out at the real world that they're gonna be entering and saying, where am I going to fit in? Uh, what kind of person do I want to be? And that is very connected with the purpose that they then seek and find, or purposes. Uh, we shouldn't only talk about it in the singular. Many people have multiple purposes, family, vocation, citizenship, uh, aesthetic, faith. Faith is a big purpose for a lot of people. And, and it's not, so people don't just have one purpose in life uh, very, very often. Great, so two other questions. I, you mentioned that some people never find purpose. It, do you have a sense of um, what the size of the purposeless population might be? <laughs> uh, well, we have done actually research um, on the what's called the encore period of life, which is late in life, ages 50 to 90. Uh, it's called encore by Mark Friedman because it's often when people look for new yeah, uh, agents in life, but um, in, in in that population, um, we 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 find still about 15, 20 percent or something like that that are really uh, kind of devoid of uh, of anything purposeful uh, in their lives, uh, and and that's not to say that the rest are fully purposeful, but. Uh, 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 more more people at that age are purposeful than the earlier ages. That's the good news that there is lifespan development. Uh, and, 
uh, I think about 40% are fully purposeful, but then most of the rest have some components or are, 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 um, uh, are at least working towards something that they, that they believe in. So I, I'm interested in this Encore study and, and way of thinking. Is, is it your sense that individuals who cultivate and develop a sense of purpose in their 20s and early 30s, that really sustains them? Or are you finding right individuals at particular points in careers or transitioning toward retirement really pivot and develop new purposes or you know, life change? family situation, they start seeking other purposes? Yeah, so all of the above. Uh, first of all, I mean, these are very good questions. Uh, purpose is a, purposefulness, purpose is a, uh, is a capacity. So once you begin finding, uh, once you go through the process of finding some purpose, it will help you um, later uh, in your, uh, in your discovery and commitment to other purposes. So it's a developmental capacity. That's why it is very helpful when young people start early and when teachers and other mentors introduce to young people the whole idea of being purposeful uh, because uh, it, it's like a muscle that you develop in a sense, uh, intellectual muscle. Uh, but yes, people don't stick with the same purpose throughout all of life. Uh, uh, and uh, a, vo a vocational purpose, for example, can change dramatically when a career changes or when one, uh, one avenue is, uh, is fully kind of used up. Uh, and so pe people do take on new purposes and that's a healthy thing to do, especially in this encore period when uh, it may be that your children have, it will be, not maybe, uh, hopefully your children will have left home and uh, gone on to their own lives and you still care about them. You're still somewhat purposeful, but it's not a day-to-day -day thing of uh, making sure they don't, you know, run in front of a car in the street or something. You know, it's, the, it's actually probably better not to, not to worry about them day-to-day call them all the time and say, you know, so, uh, so, you know, people do, do need to find new purposes. That Encore study, by the way, is on uh, the Mark Friedman's website uh, for his organization. It's called Encore.com. And the results of that study are somewhere in, in that website. You can look it up there. So you can read about uh, what we found in people ages 50 to 90. Great. Uh, so another question, how does the how does the developmental arc of purpose relate to the arc of moral development? And do you, at what points do you see them converge? Because at least my understanding is temporally they may not be happening at the same time. Well, you're right. And a, a lot of moral concepts come in very early. Uh, sharing, for example, that was my original uh, dissertation research on how preschoolers actually share and they have a sense of justice. Uh, so that, you know, that's not fair. Anybody that hangs around a playground will hear kids say that's not fair. So they're beginning to have some sense of, uh, of, of, of the moral concept of justice really early and long before they think about identity and purpose and future goals or anything like that. Uh, honesty is another one. Uh, honesty, um, the, the understanding of honesty develops in childhood. Uh, and as I said, purpose uh, is a late developing capacity. It probably requires a certain amount of neural development uh, to be able to imagine long-term future and, and sense of self over time. Uh, and a lot of moral concepts do not require that. Uh, so, uh, so, there, so there's a lot of moral growth that hopefully happens early, uh, but when it comes to, and this is the, the part I'd underline, and uh, this is what we found in our study of moral exemplars, when it comes to the kind of long-term, lifelong commitment, or at least decades-long commitment to great causes, poverty, justice, peace, environmental uh, uh, work, um, that kind of commitment really does require uh, a kind of character development and sense of uh, what we call moral identity, uh, where what is central to you as a person is the kind of person you are in a moral sense. Uh, in other words, how you define yourself. You define yourself 
by the good that you're able to accomplish in the world. And it's that development of moral identity that really um, explains a long-term commitment to a purpose. So that happens later in life. Uh, 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 that's not just simply a matter of saying, oh, I, I realize I should share, or I realize I shouldn't tell lies or something like that. That kind of long-term commitment is very connected to purpose and character development. And that's, that's the concept of moral identity that we worked out through the study of moral exemplars, the great leaders of the world, the Nelson Mandela's of the world, or people like that, that actually stuck, that act, that stuck with their causes for decades through hardship and suffering. And they're so committed. These are amazing stories. And, uh, and just one more word about that. But everybody, even though the, there are some amazing people that uh, of course we look up to, all of us can do some of that. It's, these aren't a different species. Uh, so we can all aspire to, the, to do the best we can in our much more humble way uh, than these moral exemplars. So I, will, I, will, I do want to point that out. So um, can you talk a little bit about your new book, A Round of Golf with My Father, and, and how it might relate to these questions of moral exemplars, purpose, character? Yeah, well, thank you for the question, because the book is coming out in June, and of course, it's uh, every author would, likes to have his or her book uh, uh, known, <laughs> the existence of it known by people that might be interested in reading it. Um, the, the book is very much about purpose and character. There are chapters on each, but the story, uh, just in a nutshell, is that uh, I grew up without a father. I grew up thinking that my father had died in World War II, uh, which is pretty much what everyone around me told me. Uh, and uh, I kind of discovered that wasn't true but uh, later in life, but didn't pay a lot of attention to it because I, I was already past the point where I was interested in it. But my daughter, about 15 years ago, one of my daughters um, got curious about the grandfather she never met and found out that he had not, died, not only had he not died, he'd had a significant second life, not returning from the war and abandoning me and my mother. And so I got really fascinated by this and I did some research on him myself. He had died at that point. He was dead by 20, for 10, 20 years by the time my daughter discovered this. But I discovered, so I did a kind of a case study of his life. And he was, in his own way, he was very purposeful and had some moral courage that he showed during the war, after the war. He had a significant career as a diplomat, a uh, second family. Uh, so he, there were a lot of things about his life to admire. But there was also this incredible irresponsibility that he showed by not only abandoning us, but never contacting me ever, uh, and uh, always shutting down anybody that ever wanted to um, say, what about this William anyway? So I did a case study of him. I found out that there were ways that he, his existence influenced my own life, which changed my conception of why I even pursued the career I pursued. And so I did case studies of him and myself. And, and the book, the reason it's called A Round of Golf with My Father is that I discovered that he was a great golfer. I love golf. I, I, I discovered a score, an old scorecard of his and I went to his old golf course and played against his scorecard. And that was a kind of a, a, a revelation of my own feelings about him that I explore in the book. But just in a, in a sentence, the, the point is that there was there are character issues that he had. Uh, he had this continuing irresponsibility that he showed early in his life, and that never, never ended. But then there was the purposeful side to him too, that uh, that redeemed him in a lot of ways, and it helped me forgive him also. So that's what the book is about. Uh, it's a case study, uh, but it's a case study that is meant to illustrate three things: purpose, character and a process of life review where you come to terms with your regrets, you forgive people, you, uh, you begin having gratitude for the life you've been given, even if you've had some kind of rough, rough uh, bumps along the way. Wonderful, that just sounds amazing. Uh, quite the story. Um, I'm, I'm interested in this notion, uh, as you describe him as someone who um, led a fairly purposeful life, but also had this irresponsible side. 
Yes. When you think of moral exemplars, is that a typical pattern? Or you know, I think of Nelson Mandela, geez, you know, sort of flawless. Is, okay, is so oh, this, is, this is a great question. I'm so glad you asked it. And I don't want to say anything. I mean, anybody can read Nelson Mandela's uh, biography and, and come to their own conclusion about that, because I hate to say anything critical of Nelson Mandela. However, uh, I think you will see that, uh, that, that, that nobody is flawless. I mean, no human being uh, in the entire history of the world um, uh, ever, ever, ever uh, uh, is perfect. Uh, and uh, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody does things that they may be ashamed of or that other people can criticize. I mean, famously, Mother Teresa was criticized because she used to yell at her secretary. Uh, and there was a whole book written about that, but that does not take away from the commitment uh, of her work in Calcutta, where she, you know, would save uh, uh, thousands of infants and children, and, and it was wonderful work. And the same with every moral exemplar. Uh, and so, yes, the fact is that in all in our books, some do care, uh, and in our more recent book, The Power of Ideals, we write about the personal, the small personal failings that all of all of us have, and the, including the moral exemplars. Uh, and yet their commitment to the cause that they believed in is extraordinary. And, and you, you can't let that, uh, you can't let that interfere with your admiration of what they did. The, the, you can't let their failings, because if you do that, I'll tell you the, the real problem with that. If you allow that kind of critical point of view to uh, dominate, you end up admiring no one ever. Uh, and then everybody becomes equal in a kind of a cynical nihilistic view of the world, which is, oh, we're all feet of clay. Why do people even try? Everybody, everybody messes up in some way. It's true, everybody does mess up in some way, but some people manage to do amazing good in the world and we need to preserve that and admire that. And that's one of the reasons I get a little upset when people go back in history and and look at look at great historical figures and say, well, you know, this person uh, did this. Why should we listen to, to them? Everybody does something wrong at some point in life. Everybody, everybody. But some people do a lot of good in the world, and we need to learn from that and admire that. Great. So thank you for that. Um, I want to pivot a little and talk about this past year um, and how it may be changing your thinking or changing your work, uh, amplifying certain themes. Um, How's this year affected your thought? Yeah, well, uh, I think to be really honest uh, and appropriately humble, um, I am still uh, uh, a bit confused about all of the uh, <laughs> all of the uh, uh, pandemic uh, disorganization. That it, uh, in other words, it, it's like somebody threw a bunch of confetti up in the air or cards, and they're all coming down in different ways, and um, I've seen a lot of uh, hopeful, a lot of things uh, that I'm hopeful about. Uh, I think a, a lot of people, you, including young people who we've uh, interviewed actually, use the time to sort things out and to um, reflect and to try things. Um, I think that the disturbing thing is that there has been a diminution of social relationships during this year. I, I don't think anybody can deny that. Um, you know, even if you have access to Zoom and most, most people don't actually, so that's a real problem. But even, and, and Zoom does help, but it's not the same thing as being with people in person. And so issues like intimacy, uh, which is so important and mutuality and all of the rich, benefits we get from social relations, we, we've taken a, there's been a hiatus on that. And I'm especially concerned about that for younger people. Uh, I mean, people our age, I think we can, um, we can resume and we are resuming, but younger people missed a, 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 a critical year in their learning experience. And to be really honest with you, I don't know. I'm hoping that, um, I mean, young people are resilient. It's what every grand, grandparent will tell you, and it's true. And so uh, I'm hoping they're going to bounce back and, and get right back into things and that the adults in their lives will support them in doing that. Uh, but I can't say, you know, in all, in all due humility that I, that I know for sure the answer. 
to whether there will be lag effects or things that we need to pay attention to make up to, uh, to make up uh, for the for the especially for the younger people. Uh, so I'm still in a state of a little bit of a little bit of bewilderment about this amazing uh, um, year that we've gone through. And, and thank God it seems to be coming to an end. So uh, yeah, certainly, um, sort of as a parent of many many teenagers. Um, it, sort of this year has been one that's really, I think, challenged their sense of purpose. Is is that something you're seeing in conversations? Well, we see, I see, I'm seeing both. I, I'm actually seeing young people that are very eager to get back. And and if any, I'll tell you one good thing I've seen is that I've spoken to a lot of young people that actually are really glad to get back to school and are saying things like, I, I want to learn something, or, or this is so great that we have a teacher that's trying to teach me something. And that's been one of the great problems in education is that we have these great resources that uh, a lot of kids have not appreciated uh, uh, because you know maybe there's a certain complacency. Uh, but the best attitude towards education is, wow, uh, yeah, I have this available. And, and, I'm, and of course, you used to see this in immigrant families and, and all of that. Uh, but we weren't seeing that so much. Uh, and now I'm seeing that. So that's the good news is that there's motivation and appreciation and gratitude for the opportunity to be educated. Now we need to, by we, I mean us educators, the older folks need to really step up to the plate and provide the young people with the exciting uh, adventure of, it, of learning that, they, that, that they're looking for and that we owe them. So that's really important, but if, if that, if, if, if their motivation combined with our effort to do that comes together, it, we can make up for that lost year and maybe even maybe even go beyond it because the motivation is real. So that I think is the, is the good sign I'm seeing. But I, I'm also seeing a lot of kids that, um, you know, are, uh, are kind of <laughs> dejected because they haven't had this social relationship. And so we, we need to be, we need to, as, as, we need to be a, a pay attention to that, especially for young people without the resources, uh, so they haven't had Zoom or they haven't had that. And we, we need to really help them out. Great. So I want to ask a quick question about higher education before I turn to the many, many, many questions that are teeing up. Lots of folks excited to hear from you. So mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit about the Mellon study of purpose in, in college students? Yes. Uh, so right be, before the pandemic, we were we had launched into a Mellon Foundation supported study of purpose in the college years, and the group at Mellon had determined that purpose was actually one of the uh, goals of a liberal arts education, especially uh, helping young people find it, something to believe in, uh, something that could help direct their lives and give meaning to all of the you know coursework that they're getting. You know why study chemistry anyway? Well, you know uh, there may be a good reason if you want to become a, a doctor or uh, or even uh, you know an intelligent consumer. So the why, in other words, the why uh, of of academic learning is very related to purpose. So we have a we had begun a a, a study of ten colleges and universities across the country, and taking a look at what kinds of experiences ranging from curricular to extracurricular, uh, writing for the school newspaper, or, or if there's a residential component, or what kinds of experiences most foster purposefulness in, in students. And uh, the pandemic then um, came along. And so all of a sudden the students aren't on campus. <laughs> and so, uh, so, we're, so our interviews have uh, devolved to well, what have you been doing during this uh, enforced gap year that you've had? Uh, and I will say, uh, first of all, we, we have um, some beginning uh, interesting, I, I think what will become findings, but I'm a little bit hesitant to, uh, to announce them here because uh, I, there's a part of me that actually is a uh, empirical uh, researcher. And I, I, you know, I, I wanna make sure the, statistics actually come out before I prematurely uh, tell you what we found. But I promise uh, we, 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 uh, we are in the process of analyzing the data. We are gonna be writing about this in every possible forum. Uh, and, and we have one article, Ann Colby, uh, 
um, who's one of our team members and also my wife, uh, wrote a, has written an article for the Journal of College and Character um, about some of our preliminary findings. And that will be coming out in, I think, the next issue of the Journal of Co College and Character. So uh, we'll be, we'll, we will be writing about the findings over the next couple of years. And uh, uh, so, I, but, but I'm, uh, but I'm going to hesitate to <laughs> blurt out things that may not actually uh, survive the statistical test. Uh, who knows? You know. Okay, great. Well, well, we'll look forward to hearing that because as you know, uh, Duke is one of those many campuses that's exploring right, how you do this best. Um, yeah. So, um, and we'll look for Ann Colby's article first. Yeah, okay. Um, Good. Good, so good, good. Let me turn to the first question uh, from the audience. Uh, I'm interested in ways that professional education can prepare students to discern and pursue their own purposes while recognizing and implementing the purpose of others. For example, how does a lawyer properly navigate balance and integrate his own, his or her own purposes with the purposes of his or her clients, the legal profession, the public good, et cetera? Well, let me say that, first of all, the, the desire to do exactly that, in other words, to take seriously the purposes of your clients and other stakeholders, that itself is a purpose. So that's being purposeful right there. Uh, the, um, the, the way that, uh, that in professional education, the way that people learn how to do this, it's the same. One of the, one of the nice things about development uh, that makes it uh, um, uh, good to study is that the developmental process of learning these things is the same, whether it's in high school or in a, a law firm or in, in other words, the learning is the same. And the elements of learning are, number one, observation of a purposeful model uh, of somebody that is doing this and learning from that person. That's very important. Uh, we find that. Uh, number two, um, figuring out what it is that uh, you're trying to improve, what it is you're trying to accomplish, uh, getting some sense that there's something uh, that I can make a contribution to to make better. And number three, figuring out my own special skills, talents, the way that I can do this and believing that I can do it. And when those come together, then there is purpose learning. And, and it's a very individual. So that question about in a law firm, if that's gonna look different than, uh, than in a hospital or in a, in a school or in a factory or any of the other in, infinity of places that purpose takes place. But those are, the general, those are the general principles. And then everybody has to figure it out for themselves. That's the other thing I'd point out in the context of this comment is that purpose is a very individualistic, but it's, it's collective in that it's dedicated to the world and you do it with other people. But the way you do it, the way you do it is your own way. It's, in, it's in, because nobody can, will do it like you. Uh, that's what's special. That's why it's part of your identity. You have your own contribution to make. So in the end, everyone has to really figure out their own creative way of bringing their own talents and interests to this, to this cause that they've taken on. Uh, and so there isn't a cookbook or a recipe for this, but I, the, the principles that I've mentioned apply everywhere. Okay, great. Um, next question. Is there a single set of virtues that are necessary for living with purpose? And do some purposes require specific virtues? If yes, would you offer some examples of both? <laughs> um, That's a tough well, <laughs> I, I, uh, again, I, I, I'm going to resist giving a definitive list, but uh, but I will say that there are some that are absolutely essential because purpose is a uh, a commitment. Uh, it requires diligence and perseverance and uh, grit. Uh, uh, Angela Duckworth's uh, 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 work is very relevant. So you have to stick, you have to stick with it. And so purpose does require that kind of ability to hang in there. Uh, it requires uh, resilience. Uh, you have to be able to bounce back from failure because whatever you take on in life, uh, you're, you're going to uh, every now and then uh, not achieve what you're trying to do. And a purpose means you keep going. Uh, even when you uh, when you failed, uh, that that's the nature of purpose. Uh, I think it also um, 
the discovery of purpose uh, requires a certain amount of, uh, call it open-mindedness or curiosity, uh, especially these days, the world is so complicated. You have to be able to really explore a lot of different options and, and uh, have that kind of attentiveness to, uh, so curiosity, open-mindedness. And um, I think uh, there's a kind of an imagination um, in purpose does require a, a kind of a vision, a, a kind of a sense of who you wanna be long-term, uh, the, the ability to imagine um, the future. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's a very important part of it. And it's probably the reason why it's such a late developing capacity, because we know that there is a certain amount of neurological development that's required for that kind of future imagination. So that's just a, the, the, those are just some of the, I think, uh, uh, essential elements that come together in the development of purpose. Great, thank you for that. Next up, is your understanding of purpose specifically modern or timeless, especially when you say that people after adolescence need to find their purpose? This seems specific to the modern society where one has a lot of latitude to choose what they do. How, how far back would your thinking go? That's a great question, a, a terrific question. Uh, so uh, the, the answer, the first part of the answer is uh, purpose is part of human life and, and people have written about it all the way back to, uh, as, as long as we have recorded writings in philosophy, uh, people have written about purpose, but it's absolutely right as the questioner asked that uh, purpose is, is different at a time when people don't have ready-made vocations to go into. You know, in the age of craftsmen or women, uh, when people apprenticed, they, they, they were, you know, Ben Franklin uh, apprenticed for, I think, 12 years, starting at about age 12, uh, to be a printer, uh, which was, meant publisher in those days. And that was a ready-made vocation that was all there for him, and he, and he kind of went into it. Although, he, actually, he did make a choice about it. He can see, he, I, I take that back a little bit. Ben actually had some choices and tried out some other ideas, but a lot of people didn't uh, in, in, in those days. And vocations were ready-made. Uh, you, you knew where you were gonna live. You might even know who you were supposed to marry. So a, a lot of the elements of a life, uh, of a purposeful life were kind of ready-made uh, in a way that they're not today. And so the questioner is absolutely right that there, uh, that that contemporary purpose, I think, does look different. I mean, even uh, to give one more example of this national purpose, uh, you know, in the middle of World War II, um, people shared a national purpose of fighting totalitarian uh, fascism and so on, and that was a ready-made national purpose, uh, which we don't really have today. So. There, there is a difference in how purpose is developed at times when there are lots of choices and not a lot of collective shared avenues for it, or even personal avenues such as vocations that are already prescribed for you. You can say, well, it's a good thing we have these choices, we're not forced to do things and so on, but it does make it more complicated and possibly explains why these days it's so late developing. So that's a very good question. So, and just to push on that a little bit more, right? So it, it seems that jumping into a ready-made vocation, having a sense of one's life's partner, um, it, it relieves the pressure of purpose, yeah. right? So, you so know- yeah, you're getting to, you're getting to the point. That, that's absolutely right. So let's suppose you, you're given, you're, you're told, okay, you're, you're gonna marry this person. You're gonna do this for your job. Now, the danger with that is that you will not do it purposefully because that's a mandate, those are mandates. So in order to do it purposely, you have to actually start believing in it. This is an old religious concept too. You know, the idea of vocation, I mean, that, that comes from the, that actually comes from the idea that God, that, that you're, you're hearing a calling, that God has called you. That's an old, old religious idea. And if you see it that way, uh, even if somebody gave it to you, if you really see, oh, I'm being called to do this and I believe it, then you, then you, you can be purposeful about it, even though it's ready-made. But your implication is absolutely right, which is that if somebody, if the danger is somebody's going to tell you, okay, you've got to be a shoe cobbler or something. You say, oh God, I got to be a shoe cobbler. What a drag! Uh, and that would not be purposeful. 
that would not be a purposeful vocation. So you're right. One of the one of the benefits of freely choosing, uh, amidst all, all the complexity of choices that we have these days, is that if you freely make that choice, at least you own it. It's meaningful to you. So that is you've already gotten past one hurdle of developing purposefulness. So you're absolutely right. So one more question about this. So at a place like Duke, and I imagine at Stanford, many students come in having a real clear sense of what they expect their life trajectory to be in terms of coming in pre-health, pre-law, pre-business, um, having made a decision or perhaps their family having made a decision about what their life would look like. It, is it not for, for many students sort of this, this moment that when you're asked to consider, is this really what you want? Kind of an overwhelming, bewildering, scary thing to then have to do. Sort of having grandma having decided you'd be a doctor, there's a little sense of security and comfort in that. Well, we've uh, the impression I get from our longitudinal studies uh, is that it actually doesn't work very well for parents or grandparents to try to write the script of life for the young person. Uh, I see a lot of cases where eventually there's a lot of resistance to that. And uh, everything from very premature burnout to kids saying things like, oh boy, I feel like I'm in a cage, I'm a bird in a cage or something. This just isn't me. A lot of them use the word authentic. Uh, to, uh, this is not the authentic me. So um, at least my observations from our data uh, are that that isn't a very effective strategy on the part of parents and grandparents. If the young person themselves uh, choose a career that maybe mom or dad have had or something like that, that's different uh, because they've made the choice themselves. But, you know, we get a lot of, I mean, one of our cases, a couple of uh, Silicon Valley engineers that gave their son every possible uh, head start in learning computer science, you name it. And the boy decided uh, at some point, well, you know, what I really want to do is um, go up to Napa and become a, so a French a sauce chef in a French restaurant. That's what captures my imagination. Parents could not believe this. They mm -hmm. Uh, they did everything they could to dissuade the child from the foolishness of doing it. The kid stuck with it. That little bit of resistance probably firmed up his uh, motivation. <laughs> and, but eventually they got behind it and they supported him going up there and stuff like that. But yeah, that's just one of, of lots of examples I've seen where, you know, the kids will make their own choices. And uh, if parents come down too hard, it, 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 it doesn't seem to, in my observation, it doesn't seem to work. Great, thank you for that. Um, next up, what is the impact of the way we present the need for moral character? For example, what if our presentation comes across as judgmental, condescending, or self-righteous? What does the research show about the effectiveness about approach in producing change? These are really good questions. You know, I'm, I'm delighted. I, I, I don't know why, I, I shouldn't sound surprised because I, I end up thinking and, is, but these are great questions. You know, uh, yes, uh, what you're getting at is being moralistic is not actually a good moral education strategy. Uh, hectoring, lecturing, uh, uh, virtue signaling, all that kind of stuff is really, uh, the kids do not, um, are not open to that. I can just tell you that. Uh, uh, in terms of the best educational strategy I heard, um, in my life was when I was privileged enough to do a dialogue with the Dalai Lama. Uh, it's one of these events that, you know, he, you make a presentation and then they have a discussion with him. This was up in Vancouver, the opening of his center in Vancouver. And the ritual is he, get, he gets to ask you one question afterwards and you ask him one question. And the question I asked him was actually related to this, which is how do you actually, you know, uh, convey uh, I, you know, moral sentiments, goals, this kind of thing, especially if, if, the, if they're not already on the radar screen of the young person. And he said, you have to do two things. And I thought this was a great moral, and I'm going to, I'm sure not give his, the wisdom of his answer in this, but I, I'll just say it very quickly. He said, you have to do two things and you have to do them both 
One does not work without the other. You have to convey through graphic to stories and, and descriptions and so on. You have to convey the, um, the, the misery of having a life without values, uh, of, of how empty uh, and, um, and depressing and, uh, and uh, empty uh, that, that life would be. Uh, so the negative part, that, that's kind of the, I saw this as a stick and a carrot approach, although that was not his, that, that was my, uh, and, and at the same time, you have to explain or show in graphic stories and so on, the joy of living a fulfilled, meaningful, moral life. You have to, if you do them both, uh, then, uh, and you really convey this, uh, then you will capture the imagination of the young person and they will get on board. And I thought that was a great way. So you don't get moralistic, you don't lecture, you don't say, uh, you know, you, 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 can, you tell stories and you show uh, pictures of, of, first of all, the, the, the misery of, 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 of uh, an immoral, empty, meaningless life and the joy of a purposeful life. Wow. I thought that was great. I yeah. thought that was great. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's just tremendous. Really. Tremendous. Felt, yeah. um, next up, how can we tell if efforts to affect moral character and purpose have been effective? That is, how do we assess such efforts? Yeah, um, really good question. Uh, I think uh, it's a long-term, uh, I don't know any scientific means of assessment that I would recommend. In other words, any experiments or, uh, or any of that. I think it's, it, it's, a, it, it's th this is where I think my book is actually maybe helpful. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's about a life, it's a, it's a life story uh, issue. It's, uh, it's finding out what, uh, having the person tell, uh, tell his or her life story, past, present, and future. Uh, what's the past, what am I doing now, and what, what kind of, what are my future goals? And if you can capture that, that's how you can assess it. So it's a, it's a, it's a life story assessment. Uh, and and there, are, there are methods for doing that. Uh, I'll recommend uh, Dan McAdams at Northwestern uh, University uh, has a, a wonderful uh, narrative identity scale and that kind of thing. That, that's the kind of instrument I would use for that. And I go into that in my new book. Great. Um, so we're just a minute out from the end and we always like to end with the same question, which is what are you most hopeful for right now? Uh, I, I think the thing I'm most hopeful for is a uh, revitalization of all of the ways of living, including the institutions that, and I'm going to be uh, kind of, I don't know, uh, 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 situated in our, in our own country, because that's, that's where I am. Uh, all the things that have, made, uh, that have made the American tradition um, lively, vital, creative, fair, just, uh, uh, liberty, uh, all of these things uh, with all of its imperfections. And remember I said, no perfect, no person is perfect and neither is any country. So we have plenty of imperfections and room for improvement, but all of the institutions uh, and, um, and ways of living in the American tradition that have given young people, especially hope with the American dream and all of that. That's my hope is that that will be re revitalized. That's my hope. Well, wonderful. So thank you for that. And thank you for spending this hour with us. This has just been a wonderful conversation and I appreciate it so much. And Thanks. everybody remember a round of golf with my father. <laughs> Coming thank you. Up very soon. Um, I also want to thank everybody who's joined us and remind you that next week we have Gilda Barabino, uh, she's the president of Olin College and president-elect of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So thank you so very much and have a wonderful week. Bye.